Ha! I lie to you. I said that the last video was going to be the last thing in the material series. Uh, we actually have one more thing to do. And that's entirely not due to the fact that I misread my own schedule and I forgot that I had this video planned. Uh, this is... No, that's, that's not it. It's it's just because I, I figured I would lie to you. That's just a funny thing. Right, okay, let's get into this. I want to talk about post-processing because that is technically a material thing. And while we're not going to get very deep into it because it could and potentially will be an entire series in and of itself in the future, I want to show off kind of what you can do with it, what it is. I... Real quick, covered it in my Unreal Basics playlist, but that's more so a, hey, this thing exists and you can collaborate with it. So let's in place actors here, uh, add a post-processing volume. And as long as your camera is inside of this volume, uh, let's scale it up like quite a bit here. Uh, whatever you set this processing volume uh, to do will affect the rendering of your camera. So for the most part, we can do things like adding bloom, uh, changing the exposure, uh, changing some of the color grading stuff. So we can say, hey, as long as we're in here, we want the temperature to be a lot like warmer. So now, as long as we're in here, everything is going to feel a little orange. And then when we exit out, it's normal again, and so on and so forth. Uh, we've probably covered this, you've probably seen this before, uh, I don't really care about it. Uh, one other thing is we can set this to being a boundless or infinite extent, unbound, and now it will just always affect the entire world. So even though we're outside it now, if I go and I change the tint, it will become more green or magenta, even though we're outside it. So that's kind of a cool thing you can do. Uh, we're not going to be talking about all of the color grading stuff here today. I could make an entire mini-series on that as well, especially since this is actually related to what I do in day-to-day -day life, which is video editing. I do a lot of, like, color correction stuff with that as well, so that's quite fun. Uh, but what we want to do today is we want to look for the post-processing materials that we apply to this, because we're going to write our own post-processing effect as materials, and we can apply that. So if we uh, just add one thing to the array here, we can uh, choose it's going to be an asset reference, and then we can put in pretty much any material that we want. For the most part, these aren't going to do anything because they're not set up as post-processing materials. Let me show you a couple of examples of post-processing materials that I've made in other projects, and then we'll get back to this, and I'll just show you a couple of things. So right here, we are inside of my own game project and this has a post processing material for like a line shader on it so if you look at this if we just look at it in game view you can see like a lot of things have these outlines around them like this uh platform over here is a very good example but also the enemies uh, are good examples these coffins over here you can see a little bit on this skull and that is all done through a post processing effect so you can see if i look up my post processing volume and i turn it off uh, a lot of things suddenly look a lot more flat because it is not rendering all of those lights. And especially things like uh, these bricks on the wall and the tiles on the floor, if you look at them, uh, they start looking uh, a lot less detailed because they don't have that contrasting little edge to them. So in this one, we have that very same line shader, actually. It's a little bit different in this one. I continue to develop it in uh, my current game. This is just a messing about game that I never actually really got that far into. So that's where this uh, line shader originates. Then in my current game, I uh, added a couple more things to it, like taking distance into account a little more. Uh, but we also have a cell shading uh effect here. So if you look at the mannequin here, uh, you can see that the line shader is definitely like unperfect <laughs> in this case. Uh, but you can see that he's like uh, not entirely uh, smoothly lit. Matter of fact, he looks a lot like what he does in unlit mode, uh, but it's just like a little bit different still because there's still lighting being applied here, uh, as you can see right over here but it's in a more cell shaded kind of look a look that i didn't use for my current game because it didn't really fit as well in my opinion uh but still quite a nice little thing also this project is so broken i started in unreal like 4.25 <laughs> and right now it's a 5.3 so yeah it's it's kind of broken and if i then open up that post processing volume i actually also have a, a pixelation filter here so I can turn that up to 
pixelate my viewport. So now everything looks a little bit more like pixel art. And this is how you can make a game entirely with like 3D assets, but in the end have it look like a 2D game. You're gonna have to be careful with it to make it actually look good, but it's entirely a possibility that you can do. And there's so much more interesting stuff that you can do with post-processing effects. So let's go back to our tutorial project and I'll just show you about a little bit. So in here, let's make a post-processing material. We'll just put a new material and we'll call this uh, material PP for post-processing. Just very quickly, just gonna show it off to you. In the material domain, we're gonna go into post-process. There's a couple more things that I could maybe cover in the future, but I don't really think that I wanna cover it right now. That's things like lighting functions, uh, volume lighting and user interface. If I ever do like a lighting course, that makes a lot more sense for lighting functions. Same with user interface. I don't really see myself covering that in the future because I'm by no means like good at making UI. Uh, but post-processing could also be an entire series in and of itself, which again, it might be in the future because I really like playing with this kind of stuff. We only have a emissive output color and uh, most of the post-processing workflow relies on a thing called a scene texture. So we have the scene texture color. This will uh, supply us with simple uh, color and size and in size uh, pins. And we have a scene texture ID drop down menu. And there's a lot of these. So uh, some of these won't work very well uh, for post processing. We can also use this in normal materials as well. Uh, this node, not really what we're talking about at the moment though. Because what we can use is post process input 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And this is, uh, if you hover over it, it says uh, this is the first post processing pass. So if we just hook that up, that's literally just your scene texture. As in, this is the image that the engine simply outputs to your viewport once it's done rendering your scene. And usually this is the only one that you will use. Uh, you can do some stuff with this and then send it through to post process input one and then do some more stuff with that. Uh, but you can also just like do that more stuff directly uh, <laughs> inside this material with it. So it's usually the only one that you use, uh, but that's why there are six of them so that you can use them on top of each other. I guess, technically speaking, you can then send it off to another material to do something with. Never really done that, uh, but it is something that you can do. So, post process input zero, again, is just the thing that the camera renders. And now, if you want to add something like cheap contrast, just like a contrast thing uh, through post processing, when we add that, you can see uh, it becomes a black and white image because cheap contrast uh, only works on the grayscale. Uh, so what you want to do is we want to then multiply that by the original again, so that this is now the uh, Luma values. We'll multiply that with the color values, and that will uh, just give us the same image, but slightly more uh, contrasty. So if we put in a value here, the contrast to zero, this is going to make it uh, do nothing. If we set the contrast to one, it's very contrasty. If we set it to like 0 0.1, it's a little less contrasty and so on and so forth. Uh, you can do some neat stuff with this, like one minus it, uh, and that'll probably like be a real wacky effect. This inverts the contrast, so now all of the shadows are going to be raised up, and all the highlights are going to be crushed down, so you kind of get like a negative exposure. Uh, all the colors are going to stay the same, but you have a negative exposure instead. Uh, Speaking about which, you can also uh, do a negative on the colors themselves, which will also then do a negative on the exposure. Um, so we can one minus the outputs directly and put that into the emissive color, and that will just make a negative of whatever we have. But now you can see the exposure is also getting flipped, not just the color channels. So if we want to have all of the colors being flipped, but have the exposure remain the same, what we do is we just invert the colors, add a little bit of contrast, invert that exposure, and then multiply that together. So both are negative, so the exposure is going to be positive. Now again, it's a little iffy to wrap your head around maybe. Again, it's a lot of math, but the end result will be something like this. So all of the colors are now uh, turned into the opposite color. So reds are now blues, greens are now 
like yellows, orange, <laughs> something like that. Just the opposite side of the color wheel, but the exposures remain the same. Uh, I can show you a little bit easier if we uh, put it in here. So we have the material for post-processing. When we apply that, it takes a moment to uh, calculate. Do make sure that you press apply here to compile it. So now you can see all the exposure remains the same, uh, but the colors are the other way around. So again, these used to be, that's my other project. <laughs> these used to be purple, uh, now they're green. Uh, that's the opposite of green on the color wheel. It's purple, of course. Uh, so uh, they go back and forth between like green and yellow now, I guess. Uh, so this is a much more pleasant version of turning something into a negative uh, image because it's still using the proper exposure. So that's quite a, a fun thing to do, but we can do much more with the post-processing as well uh, than that because we have a couple of things here. So we have, for instance, only the base color. We can just output the base color of whatever we're working with. So now, even though we're in lit mode, we're only seeing the base color of everything. And this is actually the way that my cell shading works in uh, that project that I just showed you. Because what it does, a uh, real quick rundown, is it uses the base color and then it multiplies that with a cheap contrast version of the actual output. And then it like clamps things so that you get this like banding. You have like three or four different shades that things can be. And we simply just use the base color and then like base color multiplied by, I don't know, like 1.4. And then a w another one with like base color multiplied by two and so on and so forth. So that's how you can make a decent uh, cell shader. Uh, what else do we have? We can just like display the metallic value of everything uh, in our scene. And as you can see, now we just got an output of only the metallic value of the entire scene. So if you, for instance, want to apply certain effects only to things that are metallic uh, for whatever reason, you can very much do that. Same thing with the roughness, material ambient occlusion. You pretty much have access to render passes for all of these separate layers of information. We can even show the normals with the world normal. So now it will show you all of the normals in world space of everything, which makes also for a very like weird looking uh, effect. If you have like a game where you have, for instance, a character on certain substances and you have like a retro inspired game, for instance, I think that this could be a little bit of a neat effect. I probably would add a like absolute node to this as well, so that it doesn't uh, make half of them black. Uh, and now we have like a much more like this feels like you've been using substances and it's like 1992 or something, right? So a lot of uh, fun stuff that we can do with that. So if we take this scene depth, for instance, this is also one that I really, really like doing. Uh, we want to divide that by a number, and that creates this kind of uh, foggy effect. Because what this is doing is it is giving you a number between zero and infinity of how far away any given pixel on your screen is from the camera. So when we are very close up to something, it's going to be rendered as black, but the further away it is, it's going to get rendered as something uh, closer and closer to white. And once it reaches a value of one, it will be fully white. And the value of one in this case will be 2000 units away. If we set this to like 7000, then a value of one won't be until something is 7000 units away. So the gradient will be a lot more smooth and subtle. And for instance, this is the thing that is used to make that line shader. What you're doing is you're comparing every pixel on your screen to the pixel next to it. And if the uh, scene depth is significantly different, that means that there is a distance between those objects, meaning that they're separate parts of an object or separate objects altogether. So we render a black pixel uh, on that edge. That's the basic idea. I have an entire video uh, showing you how to set that up as well. But now let's uh, saturate this so that it's clamped between zero and one. And then we can one minus uh, this and we can multiply this with, uh, for instance, the actual just post-processing input zero. And if we put that into the emissive color, uh, we now have this like fog effect. 
where things fade out into a fog without actually there needing to be a fog. There's also just straight up a node that does something uh, like this. But what we could do instead is maybe instead of doing that, we can hook this up into, and let's set this back to 2000 just to make the effect a little bit stronger. Uh, we can maybe input this into the contrast, right? So instead of doing it right uh, the way in there, and then we can just hook up the one minus thing directly into the contrast node here. And now we should see if we get closer to this, uh, the contrast is a lot less, but the further away we get, the more contrast uh, we're going to apply, or the other way around. Uh, I think it's the other way around, actually. Like, the further away we get, the less contrast we might have. So maybe we don't want to do that. So yeah, now the further away we are, the more contrast we're going to get. So if we get very close to something, it's going to look more or less normal uh, for the most part. And then we get further away, and that creates more contrast. So let's set this back to 8000 to make that gradient more gradual again. And we can do some like wacky stuff with this. This is effectively how you create a depth of field effect uh, that is entirely custom. So instead, let's do something like this. And I'm just showing you examples here in a somewhat random way. Uh, but we'll have a normal scene texture and then a desaturated scene texture. And we're going to uh, lerp between the two of them. So we have uh, our scene depth as the alpha. Then we have the A input being the scene texture, the B input being the desaturated scene texture, and that will go into the emissive color. And now you can see the things close to us are in black and white, and the things far away are in color. Uh, I probably actually want that the other way around. So let's get rid of the one minus in this whole equation. And this is actually a bad example because this object itself is uh, grayscale. <laughs> uh, but now, again, we can see that this is uh, in color but the further away we get the background is entirely in black and white and if we go very far away we can see slowly all those things turning black and white as well so have at it do a lot of fun stuff again this is kind of a chaotic video of me just going like oh you can do this and oh you can do that and so on and so on and so on uh i really like playing with both processing effects because as much as I like being creative with normal materials, this is really where I feel like my creativity is being like, tickled in all the right places. Specifically with the scene depth node. As you could probably tell, I really, really love using this node uh, for different things. So again, we're probably going to do a post-processing um, series at some point in the future. It's not going to be like a 15-part series like this one was. It's going to be a little bit shorter, uh, but we'll play around a little bit with some of the things in a more structured and less chaotic way than we did in this video, because I'm entirely aware that this is very chaotic, uh, and that is just what we're gonna have to deal with. I suppose you can see this as a bonus video, uh, because I told you that the series was over, and then it wasn't, but now it really is. So next time, uh, we're gonna be doing something else, whether it be the post-processing, the particles, or something else entirely, I'm not entirely sure yet. Uh, I'm sure we'll figure it out. And for the full course, if you're watching this in the future, it should be all up on the YouTube channel already. But if you're watching this shortly after it was uploaded, there will be a link down below in the description to the Patreon where you can find the full course. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. A huge thank you to my Cave Student tier supporters, Earl Monteville Erno, and my cave digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas, 